Welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. We're gonna wait for a few more folks to come into this space. We're glad you're here. Okay, well, I know people are still trickling in, but I'll go ahead and get some housekeeping out of the way. I'm Chelsea Lake. I'm a member of the events team at Politics and Pros Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you to PNP Live. So before we get started, a few of those housekeeping notes. At any point during the event, you can click on the link that I'll be dropping in the chat to purchase Frida's song. You can ask a question by using the Q&A feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's question, but apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. We are also delighted to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To access captions, simply click on the live transcript option at the bottom of your screen. Finally, it's the Politics and Pros member sale. Today is the last day. Members receive a 20% off purchase through today. So there's never been a better time to purchase Frida's song on the Politics and Pros website. And I'll also be dropping in a link for more information on becoming a member in the chat. It is now my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's speakers. Ellen Prentice Campbell. Campbell's fiction explores the way history and chance work and the people we love shape lives. Her debut novel, The Bowl with the Gold Seams, received the National Indie Excellence Award for historical fiction. Campbell's collection of stories, Contents Under Pressure, was nominated for the National Book Award. Her second collection, Known by Heart, appeared in 2020. Her short fiction has been recognized by the Pushcart Press. Campbell is a reviewer and columnist for the Washington Independent Review of Books and a contributing editor at the Fiction Writers Review. She practiced psychotherapy for many years. Prentice Campbell will be in conversation with Carrie Callaghan, the author of the historical novels, A Light of Her Own and Salt the Snow. Her short stories have been published in multiple literary journals and she is a senior editor with the Washington Independent Review of Books. She lives in Maryland with her family and three cats. Ladies, you have the floor or the screen. Thanks, Chelsea. And thank you everyone for being here. Wonderful. Yes, thank you, Chelsea. And thank you, Ellen, for inviting me to do this. This is so fun. It is such a pleasure to talk to everyone about your beautiful novel. Um, as you all may have guessed, Ellen and I met through the Washington Independent Review of Books, and it has been a delight to get to know Ellen and her writing. Um, so excited to be here today to talk about Frida's song. Uh, since the title is about Frida, I thought that's kind of where we would start. Uh, Frida from Reichman, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. How did you come to learn about her, Ellen? I first encountered Frida from Reichman when I was a social work student. And although at that point she had already been dead for decades, her collection of essays, Principles of Intensive Psychotherapy, was still something that we read in, in school. And their common sense, even though the kind of psychoanalysis she practiced was very different than the kind of psychotherapy I was preparing to practice. So I first met her as a student. And then probably about 15 years later, my husband and our three kids lived in an old part of Rockville, a couple of blocks from what was at that point still the Chestnut Lodge Psychiatric Hospital. And the sanatorium was still open. And I would sometimes with my colleagues from work go to symposia there on the grounds. And there was this shabby little white cottage that had once been Frieda from Reichmann's. And she was still kind of a, a legendary presence on the grounds. And so that was, that was my first introduction to Frieda through, my, through, through the work I did in that other life. <laughs> and that actually feels so poetically perfect that you met her as a student because she has so much to teach us in this book of yours. She, she really comes across as a wonderfully wise and yet vulnerable person. Um, so rather than hearing my opinions about Frida, how about you introduce the audience to Frida with a, a short reading from her perspective? 
I'd love to do that. You know, I my my fiction is really character driven and voice driven. And I love to I love to read because it's, you know, I think it's partly the training as a psychotherapist. I'm really listening to my characters as I write. And 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 sometimes I'm talking aloud as I write. So the voice of each character is so important to me. Now, Frida wasn't originally in the book. She was just going to be sort of this mentoring past presence, but she um, she demanded to be included. I was on a residency. I was writing on what I thought was the final draft of the book. And lo and behold, Frida would not stay out of it. And so, you know, it's fun as, as Carrie knows, being in charge of the universe. And so I was able to invent a diary that was discovered in Frida's cottage. So throughout the book in different chapters, Frida speaks from the pages of her diary in first person. Now, the little snippet I'll read takes place one morning in November 1938. Frida came to this country as a refugee from Hitler in 1935. She began practicing, she thought, for just a short period of time at the Chestnut Lodge, and it became the place she spent the next 22 years. At the time of this reading, her friend, Gertrude Jakob is living with her at the cottage. She's also a refugee analyst. I come downstairs enjoying the smell of eggs and toast and coffee. My dog Muni leads me to the front door, eager to play fetch with the paper. He gums it up with his soft spaniel mouth and brings it to Gertrude. She rewards him with a bite of toast. I open the paper. Nietzsche says, the man who does not lose his mind over certain things has no mind to lose. Gertrude, my hands tremble. I must tell her. I cannot protect her. A young German Jew exiled in Paris has killed a German official. All through Germany and Austria, they are wreaking havoc on Jewish businesses, smashing windows, stealing and burning merchandise, burning synagogues and schools. A surgeon I know in Munich arrested for the crime of being Jewish. We hold each other. The phone rings. I do not answer. Morning light glints on the silver coffee pot I purchased, filling out my life again with domestic objects deluded into believing in the security of belongings. The thick raspberry jam shines like a dark jewel, like clotted blood in the crystal dish. Crystal, crystal knocked, the paper calls it, the night of shattered glass. And that's where we'll leave them. Beautiful, thank you. And, and I love that you mentioned Gertrude in there. I think Frida's relationship with Gertrude is so special. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Absolutely, Carrie. You know, and as with your, with your fiction, it's inspired by history, but I'm so interested in the, in the universal dilemmas of friendship and loving relationships. Gertrude was originally Frida's student. Frida was a great mentor to so many people. They became friends. They traveled together as, as Hitler's presence built and, and as they realized they were going to have to find a safe haven. And they, they actually came to this country together on the same ship. Frida came at the invitation and with the sponsorship of her then husband, Eric Fromm. Gertrude Jakob was sponsored by a New York psycho psychoanalytic institute. Frida and Gertrude were deep friends and Gertrude was also an artist. She painted incredibly, um, incredibly dark emotional portraits. And, and in, in the book, she paints a portrait of Frida. Again, that's a little bit my, you know, my artistic license. But Frida and Gertrude were not only friends, they became collaborators on what they hoped would be a textbook for psychoanalysts where Gertrude painted portraits of patients representing depression, anxiety, 
paranoia and Frida wrote the text. So their partnership both as friends and colleagues was very, very deep. And, and in my book, Gertrude, who became very ill, comes to live with Frida as she did indeed in life. And, and their friendship is a deep and important one to Frida throughout her life. It's a very touching component of the story as someone who's also deeply interested in friendships. And I imagine most of the people in the audience are. It's a, as you said, a sort of common human condition that is endlessly complicated and interesting and rewarding. So, and I love that portrayal. And very closely sort of intertwined with all the characters in the book. Uh, Frida, Frida from Reichman truly did believe that the root of mental distress was loneliness. Which is, which is simple you know, to frame it that way. But I think there's so much truth in that. And Gertrude and Frida really were important to each other in a very lonely time as refugees in this country. And yet for Frida, relationships aren't always easy, right? Like her relationship with Eric, for example, yeah. was also fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit more yeah, about that? You know, and, and Eric, again, was originally Frida's student. You know, it's fascinating how times and boundaries and ethical um, rules change over the years. But indeed, Eric was Frida's student before they became lovers, before they married. But already by the time my book begins and Frida comes to this country with Eric's sponsorship, they have been separated for many years. and. It, they, neither one of them expect that their marriage will really endure. But he is, again, deeply important to Frida. And, and I think it's especially important to remember, and I think of it against the backdrop of what's going on now for Afghani refugees, that, that Frida and Eric and Gertrude and so many others were indeed fortunate to escape to the safety of the states, but we're also feeling the, the guilt of, of surviving, the loneliness of surviving, and, and the complications of establishing themselves and finding a way to, to, to work. So that Eric really opened the door for Frida to have the invitation to be a, a temporary temporary doctor at the Chestnut Lodge Sanatorium in Rockville, which at that time was very small, two doctors, a couple dozen patients. And Frida really would work there putting it on the map in a very remarkable, very, very, um, in some ways controversial way. So that for that field and in that moment of time, her, her fame really eclipsed Eric Fromm's. But of course, now, as, as a writer, Eric Fromm is much more generally known than Frida. My, my, family, my family teases me about this. They'll say, you know, Frida is not exactly a household word. Frida Fromm Reichman, and I'm like, for me, she is. And she ought to be, I think. The, yeah. At least the Frida Definitely. that I met in your book is a, a wonderful woman, full of wisdom. And, and she has very recently been validated by her, her cottage being named a National Historic Landmark, which is such a, such a win for women in science, for refugees, and for Frida. Yeah, absolutely. That's beautiful. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that actually you hadn't originally intended to, to have Frida in the story explicitly and that, you know, you were writing a more contemporary novel. Um, why uh, did you decide to, to keep those two? stories, you know, you've got a dual timeline. What is, tell me what's going on in the contemporary part of the story. I, I love having a, at least a dual timeline. I think partly because, um, you know, I think one of the things I'm writing, I'm writing about and writing because of always is memory. You know, the way memory works and the way we've got layers of both historical and current events going in our minds as we go through daily life. But you're absolutely right, as you know. I, I originally thought this was gonna be a short story. It was gonna be a short story set in Frida's cottage, which in, in truth had been renovated and I'd had a chance to tour it and it had been rented. And so sadly in 2009, the Chestnut Lodge, which had been deserted for years because of changes in the financing and treatment of mental health, burned to the ground in a mysterious fire one June night. And 
my family and I lived so close, we could smell the fire when we woke up that morning. And when I walked down and joined people at the, at the site, there was Frida's recently restored cottage still surviving. And it was so close to the lodge. I mean, spitting distance from the lodge. And I began thinking, you know, I'm gonna write a story about a current day psychotherapist who has rented Frida's cottage and is living there with her, with her kid, with her teenage kid. And, and so it was going to be Eliza's story. It was going to be the story of this current day psychotherapist who was having some struggles with her work and a lot of struggles with her teenage son. And, and, and so I began. And as, as often is the case, the short story kind of evolved into something that couldn't quite fit the confines of my original arc. And the, the piece of Frida that was always there was in my, in my vision of the cottage, there was a requirement by the historic society which had renovated the cottage that Frida's photograph hang in the cottage. And I love the photographs of Frida. And I, I just felt if someone lived in that cottage, it would be meaningful to have Frida just looking down on them. But what happened was Frida began speaking to me. And I think it was, it was sort of a two-part thing. During the time I was working on the book, I moved from Rockville to DC and we, we relocated to an apartment. So I was often taking the subway to work in Rockville and I would read on the subway. And I found myself, because I was working on this novel, rereading Frida's Principles of Intensive Psychotherapy, which I, I had read at times over the course of my 30 years working, but I had not ever read it as a writer, as a writer of fiction. And so I think her voice began speaking to me at that point. And then when I was on a residency in, at VCCA in Virginia, and, and Frida's, Frida's picture was looking at me. I mean, I have to be honest. I think Frida's picture was also part of the mentorship for me of the book. And I just felt Frida saying she needed to have her say. She needed to be part of this. And I also, by that time, knew my character Eliza quite well. And my character Eliza has many strengths, but she was also in many ways very lost. At, and, and very much at sea, both professionally and personally and as a mother. And I found her more and more consulting Frida and it just only seemed right, I think both to me and to Eliza and to Frida that Frida would begin talking back. And then you know the fun, cause you've done this, you know the fun then of figuring out a workaround because I was like, well, Frida's original language is German. I, I don't speak German and I can't have her speak from a German language page. So the, so the diary that Eliza found in one of the cupboards in the cottage, and, and this cottage really, you know, it has such an incredible amount of storage. Frida helped design it and that storage was her idea, I'm sure. So the diary in my imagination was a diary that Frida kept all through her years at the lodge, but intentionally kept in English as an additional practice for her. So that, you know, so that, that made it possible in that way. And, and the diary became a real, a real um, important piece of Eliza's life. Yeah, and it's, it's a wonderful trope, I guess you can call it. You, you made use of that very well. I want to ask you to read from Eliza's point of view so that we can all hear a little bit more from her. Right before you do that, though, I just want to remind folks that there will be an opportunity for you in the audience to ask Ellen some questions. So as you think of your questions, please go ahead and enter them into the Q&A function at the bottom there of your screen. Or if you're not sure how to do that, you can put it in the chat. And I think Chelsea will help us get into the Q&A. Um, but so please, Ellen, let's hear from Eliza. Okay, so, so let me just tell you, you don't need to know much, but Eliza, as you already know, lives in Frida's cottage. She's a psychotherapist. She has a 16 year old son named Nick. And in this little tiny piece I'm going to read to you, Eliza's had a long day. Nick was kicked out of sleepaway camp. He went to a Quaker camp 
he was kicked out and she had gone down to pick him up. She had brought him back. And now it's late at night and he has disappeared into the night on his skateboard and she doesn't know where he is. She's alone in the cottage. She texted Nick, looking up at Frida's photograph hanging above her desk as required by the Historic Society. The famous doctor looked tiny in a big leather chair. She wore a cardigan draped over her shoulders, a string of pearls, and held a black spaniel on her lap. Nick said it was weird, but Eliza liked having her there, quiet, non-judgmental, the perfect analyst, the non-anxious presence Eliza aspired to be. Frida's eyes gleamed with intelligence and warmth, and she had a faint, all-knowing Mona Lisa smile. It was the classic analyst face, neutral, kind, the expression that opened you up. I'm scared, Frida, Eliza said. And it helped, just as Eliza told her clients, putting it into words. And though Nick would tease her if he knew, it did help having the wise woman smiling down from the frame on the wall, listening. And that's, and that's Eliza, and that's Frida listening. And I would say, you know, listening is such an important part of both, both my work as a writer, listening to characters, my past work as a psychotherapist, listening to clients, and such an important part of what is going on in this book with Frida listening to people, Frida loses her hearing, Eliza listening, and sometimes not hearing what friends and her son are saying. And Nick, you know, 16 year olds and listening, it's a, it's a tricky thing. That reminds me, you got this wonderful review that said you were a deft ventriloquist. And I know that was very meaningful to you, um, both because of what you just said, but also for a personal reason that you mentioned. Can you share that? Yeah, I, I just loved that comment that I was a ventriloquist um, in this book with the different voices. Partly I loved it because my paternal grandfather, um, Frank Campbell, put himself through seminary by going on what was then the Chautauqua circuit. You know, this would have been in the early days of the 20th century. So he would go from little tent theater to little tent theater doing a one man show basically. And we still have copies of a, of a poster of his. And wow. it has many little pictures of him around the slogan, which is the man of a hundred faces. And, and so I, it just, it, it was very meaningful to me to think that in some way that tradition of being able to ventriloquize, if that's a, a verb, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there is some sort of family legacy there that you're fulfilling. <laughs> how do you listen to your characters? I mean, obviously, I, I know how you would listen to your patients. How do you listen yeah. to your characters? Well, for me, you know, for me, of course, what comes first is, is the sort of the germ of an idea for the story and, and, be, and beginning to write, beginning to frame it from the point of view of the first character who, who in, in my mind's ear is speaking to me. You know, so right from the beginning, I'm, I'm not really hitting my stride writing until I can begin to, in that, in that inner ear. And it is funny similarities with being a psychotherapist because there's a very famous expression about the third ear that a psychotherapist listens with. And in a way, I feel like a, a writer of fiction that's character driven and voice driven like mine, and I think yours too, Carrie, that we are listening in a way with the third year. So I start listening, I start getting the voice and I, I have to work in a, in a room with the door shut because if I'm beginning to get the flow of it, sometimes I begin speaking aloud as, as, it, as it feels like the character would be speaking. So it's it's a it's a it's kind of a it's kind of an interaction between me and the character and and it's a funny thing where I'm both inventing the character and and that's true 
That's true, even with someone like Frida, who's deeply inspired by a very real person. But I have to say over and over again, the Frida, my Frida is a fictionalized Frida, a fictionalized Frida, you know? Yeah. But, but you're beginning to both invent the character and then the character begins to set you on the course. Um, I wanna read one of the questions from the audience here. Judith is asking if you wonder if, and I had this same question, if Frida and Gertrude may have also had a romantic relationship along with their deep friendship. There's something sort of suggested there. So without getting into any spoilers, do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, in, in, my, in my sense of Frida and Gertrude's friendship, it's a deep friendship that is also a passionate friendship for them. Um, and, and again, that's my, that's my author's perspective on it. Um, whether that's true or not, who knows? One of the resources that was so invaluable to me as I researched the book was a wonderful biography of Frida, which was written by Gail Hornstein. And I had the pleasure and honor of being on a panel with Gail when we were presenting the application for Frida's Cottage to become a historic landmark. And then I had the further pleasure of hearing Gail give a talk, um, an online talk about Frida as part of a series of talks about Frida from Reichman that Peerless Rockville did. And, and I know that, that Dr. Hornstein would disagree with my interpretation of, of Frida and Gertrude's relationship also having a passionate, um, a passionate depth to it. But I think, you know, I think that sort of, is an interesting illustration of the way biography and history do split from imagined recreated fiction. So I think that's partly, partly the answer. And, and I'll say one more thing. I'll say yeah. one more thing. It's dangerous to get me talking about this, but you know, I was doing, I was working on this book for a long time, 10 years and change. And certainly at first when I was working on it, it was an open, wonderful world. I mean, the book was already slated for publication when everything shut down. And so I did, of course, living in Washington, go to the Library of Congress, hoping, you know, and there was no trove of Frida papers there. You know, there were some articles. There were a couple of wonderful magazine articles about Gertrude Jacobs paintings. But interestingly enough, Frida's many of Frida's personal papers and, and many drafts of essays she was working on disappeared on or shortly after the day of her death from the cottage. And interestingly, it was determined who had disappeared them, likely with the best of protective intentions. And arrangements were made for these documents, eventually, at least some of them, to find a home at the Library of Congress but they've been sealed for 20 years and they, oh, will, wow. and they will be opened this year. So there's a little tiny part of me that says, well, maybe there's just a chance that there's something in those papers that will, that will shed a little bit more light on my imagined hypotheses. Yeah, are you gonna be first in line waiting <laughs> at the door? I think there's gonna be a fairly long line. I think, <laughs> I think Dr. Hornstein deserves to be first and I'm sure she'll be first. Um, <laughs> but maybe I, she I, will, share. I will join the queue. Let me tell you, I'll join the queue. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. What, are the, what sort of obligations do you feel having written about a real historical figure, if any? I, I, feel, I feel an obligation to be as true as I can be to my understanding of, of who the person was within the time she lived and, and to be respectful, not, not, to, not to take things unfairly out of context um, you know, for example, in terms of the relationship with Gertrude and Frida, I, I, I feel like there, there was um, emotional truth supporting the possibility that this very important friendship also included 
a, a romantic passion. It's possible, it may not be, but it, it felt like it was an emotional, emotionally true possibility. And so in that way, I did not feel like I was um, making unfair attributions or appropriating in a way that was that was wrong. Um, and so I do I do feel a really deep responsibility to to the emotional truth, you know, which also goes in a way, Carrie, to to a little bit about the process of how I research. I was neither the bull with gold scenes nor with Frida's song. Did I seek to interview people who who would have been alive at the moment in time I was writing about, who would have known perhaps some of the real characters who appear in my novels. And I think that was partly because I wanted the freedom to identify what I felt was, was emotionally true and true to the narrative. And I think it was also, and, and this gets a little complicated, but I think it was also that I wasn't completely aware of it because as a psychotherapy, the, the ethic, the principle of complete secrecy is so important that I, I think I felt a hesitancy to, to gather stories because then I would feel like I was, I, was, I was abusing confidence if I used them. Now, that isn't to say I don't regret that sometimes. Always after a book comes out, and I know you've experienced this, you hear these wonderful things and you think, oh, I wish I had known that. So, you know, Frida's song had no sooner been out than a longtime friend and neighbor in Rockville said, well, you know, my husband took a class with Frida. She taught a class for lay people who wanted to be analysts. And he said, Frida always wore a little fur cape to that class. And I was like, oh, I would have killed for that detail. <laughs> I would have found That's a way right. to work that detail in. <laughs> That's right. Oh, it's those small details. Those are so fun. They're so important. <laughs> um, Judy Krasik asks uh, something I was going to ask you as well, so I may as well get it in here. Um, can you read from Nick's point of view? We've got a, a third perspective that we haven't talked about yet. So tell us a little bit about Nick and then uh, let's hear from him. If you don't okay, I, I'd love to read from Nick. You know, I, I can't write about people without really caring about them and coming to, to love them in some ways. And, and I have to say that Nick in the original short story was so prickly and so difficult that it wasn't very easy to love him. But as the book evolved, Nick became more and more and more a person with a lot of contradictions and a lot going on, but someone that I really felt a deep affection for. And, and he also really surprised me, you know, because for me to write and, and feel like I'm almost inhabiting the way an actor inhabits a role, a 16 year old boy was was kind of surprising. And um, I'm, I may or may not have gotten it right, but it felt true to me. And so, so Nick became a very present, very lively member of the cast. Um, Absolutely. So I'm, I'm going to read just a tiny, tiny passage. And this goes right alongside the passage I read a few moments ago from his mother Eliza's point of view. It's that dark night He's been kicked out of camp. He's home against every wish in Rockville. He's taken his skateboard and he's gone. The sign for the pedestrian bridge across the train tracks was all lit up. The Peace Bridge, winner of the naming contest at school. The girl who thought it up stood near him in chorus, pale but pretty. In a way, she was right. Crossing over from East to West Rockville was kind of like going over the Berlin Wall or the Rio Grande. One night, his mom was driving him to basketball practice in the community center over here and a cop stopped her. He was too little back then to know why. The cop thought she was shopping for crack. That would be the day, her shopping for crack. The bridge had a cage of wire but someone with an assault rifle could do serious damage from up here. Like the sniper when he was in fourth grade, 
cruising around in an old green car, shooting people at gas stations, even a kid in a parking lot. She drove him to school till they caught the man. She made him wear his seatbelt and sit on the seat, even though a bullet could come right in and he would have been safer hiding on the floor. Turned out the sniper had a kid with him locked in the trunk who did some of the shooting. He was in jail now too for life. The guy wasn't his father. The bridge steps had no backs, like the cellar stairs at his grandparents' house, their old house now. The kind of stairs you could slip through. Don't believe everything you think, Ma told him. But look at the people who got their feet trapped by shoelaces on Metro and had to have their legs amputated. Things happen. And that's Nick. I love that. <laughs> you know, I, I, I went out to Frida's cottage right before the book appeared, right before it was released, because I was filming um, a little trailer as part of the pre-publication pre promotion. And you can watch that little trailer. But as I walked up the driveway to Frida's cottage, all of a sudden down the driveway come three kids on their skateboards. And I'm like, oh my God, you know? It's Nick waiting for me or coming for yeah. me, you know, oh, there wonderful. he is. <laughs> that's great. It does sometimes feel like there is some sort of universal energy around a piece of art. And I think that's true. That's and true. it was really important to me that, that this book really is about, um, it, it's really about relationships, about parents and kids and friends and the work of trying to care for people, both the people we love and are connected to and people we're working with. And so um, the fact that Nick and Eliza are having their struggles is, is very much um, part of what, um, what I think is, is deeply embedded in the book. Yeah. Which is why I have to have that present day piece going on. <laughs> one of my favorite themes of the book, I, there are many, but one of the things that really struck me was how you talk about, and Frida talks about this blurred line between health and illness. Um, why did you decide to highlight that? And then what did that mean for you and the characters? Well, I, you know, first of all, I think that it is something that I just, I just believe in very deeply. Uh, and, and it's something that, that Frida believed in very deeply. And it's something that by extension, Eliza, who is a therapist, comes to believe very deeply. It was also important to me to have that in for a couple of reasons. Uh, one being that I think always, you know, certainly during World War II and the Holocaust, um, certainly in, in our own country, in terms of our continuing struggles with race relations, certainly in terms of what's going on now as, as shortly we begin to take in Afghani families. There's such a tendency to be fearful of the other, you know, to be fearful of the person who looks different or who acts different. And, and often a person who is, um, who, who is struggling with, with mental illness or struggling with a severe um, a severe depression or a severe anxiety can appear different and can appear in some way off-putting. And I, and I think it's, it's important that we all remember how, how close along the same continuum we are, you know? So that's part of why that was very important to me. That's such an important message. Um, yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, I want to get to some of the audience questions now, although I have lots of my own um, to continue with as well. But um, Melanie Davis wants to know how long it took you to write this book. Uh, you mentioned that a little bit already, but if you can talk a little bit more about your process. And then was this one easier to write compared to some of the other things you've written or not? And, and what went into that? Thanks, Melanie, that's a good question. I, I started working on this story shortly after Chestnut Lodge burned in 2009. And I continued working on it over the next almost 10 years. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't work on it continually every single day. I mean, during that time, I also had, 
had another novel published and worked on other stories. But I really did work on both the research and the writing for over 10 years. And, and that's actually the same amount of time it took me to work on my first novel, The Bull with Gold Seams. And, and you know, neither one of these are exactly thick. <laughs> But for me, the process is a gradual one, I think. And, and so I'm not surprised it, it took me that long. In terms of whether this was easier or harder or different from some of the stories I've written or my first novel, because again, you know, I, I came to this writing life only, only a little less than 20 years ago. You know, it's funny, we're right at the anniversary of 9-11 and there's a way in which the enormous, um, the enormous impact of 9-11, I think, pushed me into beginning to write, which was something I had put on the side for many years. I think it reminded all of us that, you know, there's no, there's no counting on how much time we have. Writing Frida's song was different than either um, The Bull with the Gold Scenes or the short stories. Uh, you know, for me, a short story is something that, that comes with, with a little bit more of a feeling of, of something is already in my mind, almost complete. And some short stories stay that way. You know, they, they stay within that, that, that frame, that original frame. And, and I'm not a quick writer. They could take me six months or more to write, but it's not a matter of years to write it, unless I put it aside. With, with a novel, the experience I've had, and this is just my second novel, is more that it's an evolving, it's an evolving narrative. In, in the case of both Frida's song and The Bull with Gold Scenes, I, I, I knew the point of impact. I knew the point that was sort of starting me. Hello, Kat. And I knew, I knew, in, I, I thought I knew as soon as I recognized that both were not short stories, but were going to be longer works. I knew where I was heading in terms of an ending, but the middle pieces had lots of changes and lots of twists and turns along the way. I, you, you may know who said it, I can't remember, but someone has said that writing a novel is a little bit like driving a car to a known destination in the dark. And, and I think that's very true for me that I sort of know where I'm heading. I know where I'm heading, but the getting there is complex. And that's part of the fun, right? And it's that's part of the fun when it's not driving you crazy. And you don't feel lost <laughs> and you don't want the GPS to just tell you already. That's right, yeah. Um, I feel like it may have been Stephen King who said that. Or Edward Maybe it was, I think you're I'm right. Sure. It might, it might have been, it's, it's true, it's so true. Yeah. Um, Jenny Iacovici, who is a talented novelist herself, folks, uh, up The Hill to Home is the title of her novel. Um, she wants to know, she says, presuming Frida didn't discuss her impending and increasing deafness, how did you learn of this, which you know would be a career ending disability for a practicing psychotherapist? Yeah. I, you know, again, my, my first knowledge of it came through Gail Hornstein's incredibly profound and, and thorough biography, where she, where she writes about the, um, the familial deafness that was a genetic part of, of Frida's background. Her father became deaf, her mother became deaf, and Frida became deaf. Um, so that was, that was originally how, how I learned of it. And then it did become very much part of the novel in that, um, obviously for Frida, it was a tremendous barrier and obstacle. And, and then for Eliza, who is, who is, who is struggling to, to both understand how she can best do her work and is very much influenced by, by Frida, she's, she's feeling that very deeply. And, you know, it, that makes me think too, that, um, you know, for all of the characters in this book, listening is so important. And I think that's part of why in the end, the title of the book became Frida's song because music is important to all three of the characters. Uh, Nick, Nick has a theremin 
And I didn't know about theremins till, till Nick came into my life. But, but Nick has a theremin, uh, which, which he loves, but which is also this sort of disembodied instrument. Uh, Frida was a, a really fine amateur pianist and, and continued to play piano even later in life and, and continued to play in a small chamber group, even in, you know, in, the, in the initial phases of losing her hearing. And, and then Eliza, who, who lives in Frida's cottage, and I, you know, this cottage is sort of another character in the book. In, in my imagined cottage, Frida's piano has remained in the cottage all these years. And so Eliza begins to play piano on Frida's piano using the sheet music that's in the piano bench. And it just happens to be um, music that was extremely dear to Frida, which, which is Mendelssohn's Songs Without Music. And, and, and so music is sort of a thread of, uh, of consolation and of, um, and, and of love that runs throughout the book and part of the listening. So beautiful. And also the, the common thread of humanity, right? That no matter what time you live in, that you have something in common with people who went before you. And that gets us to a question Jessica Glover says, you know, if you were able to actually go back and talk to Frida, um, what would you ask her? Oh, you know, that's like, you know, who would you invite to a, who would you invite to a dinner party? And what immediately comes to my mind is I would, I would love it if Frida and Eliza and Nick and I could all sit around the dining table in her living room in the cottage, which is a very small living room. And I guess one thing I would want to ask her, I guess one thing I would want to ask her is what, what she would think and what she would recommend we, and, and I guess by that, I mean both we as people, all of us, and then also specifically we who practice um, the, the healing work of, of therapy or other kinds of work like that, what she would, would recommend to us as ways to proceed in a time when there are, there are wonderful resources that were not available at Frida's time in terms of advances that have been made with medications, but there are also enormous challenges in that some of the, the long and patient work that Frida espoused is, is, is no longer possible and is no longer practiced. So I, I feel like I'd love to know what, what her impressions and recommendations would be for workarounds about that. And that sense of changing um, therapy practice is one of the real tragedies of the book, at least that how I felt, you know, that yeah. we don't live in a time where it would be easy to get the long patient care and listening that Frida could have provided. And, and it is, and it is a loss, you know, again, I, I don't, I don't mean to over idealize that, you know, that every patient benefited from that, that there weren't abuses of that, that, that there weren't failures of that, because all of the above is true as well. But I do still think that um, that it is so important for each of us to be to be heard, and particularly, I think it's a tremendously important part of work. And it is harder to do that deep listening when you're doing it in a very very concentrated session time, and you know your number of sessions is very limited. So I'd yeah. love to have Frida struggling with that problem along with us. She might have some she might have some light to shed on it. Yeah, I'm sure she would. Um, Rebecca Scott wants to know if you're apprehensive at all about the archives that are opening, um, or is your, your feeling about the difference between fiction and history and historical writing sort of, does that console you and put you to ease, at ease? That's, but, a, you that's know. a good question, Rebecca Scott, and it's truly, I know, a historian's question. Um, you know, of course I'm apprehensive, but there's but there's also a way in which I'm more curious than apprehensive. You know, I'm more curious than apprehensive. And, and, and you know, just as all of us, certainly myself, have had the experience of, of getting it wrong, um, of misunderstanding someone, of 
thinking we know something and finding we were wrong. I, I know there's the possibility that there will be, uh, there's the probability that there will be material in the archives that doesn't jive with my imagined narrative. But, but I also just have this sense of, so long as, as an author, I'm emotionally true to the, to the story, I, I just have to believe, I have to hope that, that both the characters and the historians would forgive me my errors. I'm sure. And, and I wonder in a work of art, is it even an error, you know, because this, that is the difference as Rebecca suggested between fiction and history writing. Well, and that's a wonderful question and a wonderful question coming from you, Carrie, having, having written novels, both about women who work with paint and women who work with words. Um, yeah, and it, it's always an interpretation, right? right. Um, Judith has Judith Nelson has an interesting question here. Um, she notes that the uh, therapist Clara Freed in the novel "I Never Promise You a Rose Garden" is reputed to be based on Frida. Did you consider that in your research? Um, or I knew that. Thoughts I, on that. I certainly know that. You know, I mean, I certainly knew that. That's that's very well established, very well documented, and 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 there are wonderful chapters in Gail Hornstein's biography about that um, parallel. I, I chose, however, I chose, however, not to reread I Never Promised You a Rose Garden, which I probably read in, in um, high school. I, and I chose not to, not to look deeply into that parallel. I, I include um, I include the doctor patient relationship, which is certainly based on uh, Joanne Greenberg's experience with Frida in the book. But I chose to include it in a way that I felt like preserved, in a way preserved the screen of confidentiality for both Joanne Greenberg and Frida from Reichman. Uh, so that the author of that wonderful novel has, has her own true story that she is fictionalizing in that novel. And I, and I, wouldn't, and I wouldn't tread on it. Um, so the, the story of that very special patient relationship very late in Frida's work is included in the novel, but, um, but with, a, with a privacy screen, I guess if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just want to remind everyone to um, go ahead and check out the book, uh, Frida's Song, on the links that Chelsea has put in the chat at Politics and Prose. We're going to ask uh, one or two more questions before we wrap up today. Um, Sarah Brown wants to know, how long do you write each day? How many days? How many hours for research? And do you dream about your characters? Oh, Sarah Brown, and I love to think that we'll be able to see each other one of these days. I, it depends, you know, for me, it's a really good writing rhythm if I can write in the morning for at least a couple of hours, but that's the ideal. And what I, what I find happening in my current work, because I'm, I'm in the process of continuing research on a novel that I thought I had almost completed a draft on about a year ago. And then I got caught up in, in the process of getting Frida ready for publication and sort of put it aside. And then just this summer, I began delving into material that newly became available to me. Cause again, it's a novel that's inspired by some real people. And I found that I'm gonna have to go back. Lucky me, I've got some wonderful new material. I'm gonna have to go back and, and reimagine parts of it. And I'm having a difficult time now, to be really frank, in terms of switching gears between, um, between the, the, the exciting and, and fortunate opportunities to tell people about Frida's song and then sort of the necessary quiet and solitude to get back to writing. Um, that time will come. But, but I like your question, do I dream about my characters? And one thing I would say is sometimes when I can't sleep, 
in addition to my good luck charm of walking through the houses I've lived in, sometimes when I can't sleep, I find it's a wonderful time to just think about um, a situation a character's encountering or to think about my problem with figuring out where, I, where, where I'm going. And, um, and it distracts me from being unable to sleep. <laughs> And then if I'm lucky, I remember in the next morning. I feel like that's the catch if you're lucky to remember the, the next morning. That's the catch. All right. Well, I have one last question and then we will conclude for today. Um, you mentioned, you said earlier, you look forward to seeing your friends um, when, when we're able to do that sort of thing again. Um, I think we've all been kind of grappling with this isolation and the loneliness that has come from that. What do you think Frida and Eliza and Nick would have to say to us all about loneliness and connection right now? I think, I think Frida, um, Frida would definitely remind us that, that loneliness is really the, the most painful of human conditions. And I think she would encourage us to find ways to, to, to work around that and reach out and connect. And I think that's partly, you know, that's partly for her music. Um, for Eliza, I think it was partly a, a really sustaining friend she had, her friend Dee. Um, for, for Nick, I think he's struggling to find that, but during the course of the book, I think he begins to find that. And, um, and he might advise us to, to get out there and get active. I'm not gonna go skateboarding, but, but there is something wonderful about meeting people when you're biking and knowing there are other people out there um, because I miss my swimming friends. So that's part of it. And I think also just, you know, I think for me art, whether it's books or music or paintings is such a wonderful way to feel connected, you know, both to other people in this moment here and now and to people who are no longer here. Um, there, 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 are so many, um, there are so many ways in which art, I think, provides us with connection and with comfort. Um, you know, even, even for me with Frida's song, the cover of the book is a beautiful painting by someone I met through writing or re-encountered through writing. And, and so there's a way in which both loving art and loving music and writing is, is a tremendous way to connect. So I, I give a plug for, for reading and writing and looking at art and listening to music, even if it's on the theremin. <laughs> and, uh, and gratitude to independent bookstores like Politics and Prose, right? For oh, giving us spaces absolutely. to come together. Giving us spaces to come together. I think my very, one of my very last live events was hearing you talk about Salt the Snow at Politics and Prose. And it's so good. To I see did just you make again. it under the wire. It's so good to see you again. So thank you, Chelsea. Thank you. Oh, thank you both. Thank you both. What what a, what a lovely conversation. I think I speak for everybody when I say I wish we had more time, but alas, it is at the um, hour is over. Um, thank you, everybody. Oh, and a and a kid cameo. <laughs> Even better, kid home from camp. Um, and then love the cat. We, we love all those um, fun cameos here at Politics and Prose. As a gentle reminder, I put the book link um, in the chat. It, it'll take you directly to the Politics and Prose website. While you're there, uh, check out the events page. We'd love to see you all at another event soon. In the meantime, stay well, everyone, and stay well read. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.